Right? If you were to go and show the cover of my book to many social scientists, uh, they might say, this is nothing new here. We already know that voters know very little about politics and economics. And so it's not that the cover should shock the social scientists so much. It actually seems to be what they've been saying all along. Uh, but the interesting thing is that if you go and push social scientists further, they will often add, yes, it's true, the voters know very little about politics, very little about policy, very little about economics. But then, then they will add, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't matter whether or not voters know what's going on. Right? Now you might reply, how could it possibly not matter? It seems counterintuitive. If you're about to get surgery and the doctor appears to know nothing about anatomy, if you, you know, so you could say, I need some surgery for this, well, we'll just cut you open, squish around, find something, cut it out. And you say, well, the guy doesn't seem to even know parts of the body. Why would I trust him to open me up and do something? So, well, he knows, but it works out. It works out one way or another, despite his apparent lack of knowledge. Uh, you probably run out of the operating room uh, in, in great fear for your life, saying, look, there's no way that someone who doesn't have basic knowledge about what's going on can do a good job. Okay. So how could it not matter if government by the people, or you know, if, if the people who actually run the show in democracy, namely voters, don't know what's going on, well, there is a clear and simple story about why, how this is so. And it says, look, if voters, if voter errors are random, if voters who don't know what they're doing basically reach from their pocket and flip a coin, then everything will work out just fine. Why? Well, there's a principle of basic statistics called the law of large numbers. Anyone heard of the law of large numbers at some point? Yes, it's here. No, no. Uh, what, it, what the law of large numbers says is that on average, random errors tend to cancel out. And what this means is if voters don't know what they're doing, simply flip a coin, then those people who will flip a coin will cancel each other out, and that this will leave the well-informed in charge. All right, so just to give you a very simple example of this, uh, suppose uh, that we have a world where that is actually much worse than what even I say. So suppose that 90% of voters know absolutely nothing. So they know literally nothing. They don't know uh, who the presidential candidates are, they don't know what they stand for, they don't even know what country they're in. All right, they know nothing. All right, and then suppose, uh, again, just to make the example clear, uh, that 10% of people know everything. So they're like walking Wikipedias, or they're walking, walking edited Wikipedias. Okay? It's all fact-checked. Right? Now suppose that you're going and chatting with people waiting in line to vote, and you find that nine out of 10 of these people know zero. Nine out of these 10 of these people know absolutely nothing. So for example, if it were an election between um, the Unabomber, so everyone, everyone here probably remembers the Unabomber. Uh, yes, did you read his manifesto? It's quite interesting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, on the one hand, getting rid of technology will require the destruction of billions of lives, but it's the only way that we can get a decent life, so let's go for it. All right, so that's the part, part, of, part of the manifesto. Okay, so suppose that we have an election between the Unabomber and some non-genocidal candidate. Okay. All right, now you're talking uh, in line with people waiting to vote, and you find that 9 out of 10 of the people are planning on flipping a coin. Uh, you might be very nervous. And you say, well, this Unabomber guy, I mean, you know, he favors exterminating billions of people. And say, well, that's what some people say, but other people say he's great. I don't know. I'm going to flip a coin when I get it and make up my mind at the time. All right? And then one person in 10 that you talk to knows exactly what's going on and is uh, trembling in his boots. Says, he says, yes, well, I've read the entire manifesto. Would you like me to recite page 37 of it for you? All right? Well, it uh, seems kind of bad to have a system where 90% of people don't know what they're doing, 10% of people know everything, and get its majority rule. So you might be very nervous. And yet, under the assumptions, under the assumption that people who don't know they're doing flip a coin, you're actually perfectly safe. Like you're almost perfectly safe. Okay, so the, if the two candidates compete, who's going to win? Well, out of the uninformed voters, they're going to flip a coin. So as long as the number of voters is reasonably large, we know that out of those 90 percentage points of people who don't know anything, almost exactly 45 percentage points will come for the Unabomber, 45 percentage points will go for the non-genocidal candidate. So, so far, it is roughly a dead heat. But then we go over to the remaining 10% of people who know what's going on. What do they do? Well, I will make the assumption that people who are well-informed don't want billions of people to die for no particular reason. So let's say that all 10 percentage points of the informed voters are against the Unabomber. Well, you go and you add this up, and the Unabomber gets 45 percentage points worth of uninformed votes, zero percentage points worth of informed votes for a total of 45. The non-genocidal candidate gets 45 percentage points worth of uninformed votes plus 10 of the informed votes for 55. And you can then go, you know, all right, we narrowly survived this election. What about next time? And the answer is, as long as the assumptions that I just gave you are right, next time you're going to be safe too. Each and every time you're going to be safe, because it is phenomenally, phenomenally unlikely that when billions of people flip their coins, that it's going to turn out to be enough to outbalance those informed voters. Okay? Now, this result has a very, uh, this, this result has 
interesting because it implies uh, that in order for a candidate to win, he requires a support of a majority of the well-informed. So even in a world where there's a lot of uninformed people, to win, you need the informed people to support you. Right? And this is interesting because, you know, suppose that everyone were well-informed. What would you need to win in democracy? The support of the majority of the well-informed. What do you need if hardly, if hardly anyone is informed? Once again, a support of the majority of the well-informed. That seems like a pretty good result. Okay? And the result has a nice name. It is called the miracle of aggregation. It's a miracle. Okay, it's lead into gold, okay, but you know, this, is not, they're not, this is not actually requesting that you have any faith in anything. This is a very clear and logically valid argument. Uh, so if the assumptions are true, the conclusion follows. Right? So what seems miraculous about it is that it implies that a highly uninformed electorate can act as if it were, it were perfectly informed. A highly uninformed electorate can be every bit as good in practice as one where everybody knew everything. So that's why I like to compo compo compare it to medieval alchemy. It's like saying, let's get 90% lead, 10% gold. We'll put a cloth over it. We'll say, hocus pocus, and lo and behold, 24 karat gold. Right. All right, that sounds pretty good. Okay, but uh, this brings me to one of my favorite sayings. And whenever I give this uh, talk in other countries, I check to make sure they have the saying. And this, so far, every country I've been to has the saying, or some close version of it. And that is, if it seems too good to be true, then it probably is. Uh, is that, has anyone here watched late night television? Uh, for, you know, so uh, lately, I guess you'll see ads for you too can become rich investing in foreclosure properties. Uh, my favorite ones are you too can become out rich, become rich with your own alpaca farm. <laughs> right? Right? I mean, me, I could do it. I could go into my backyard and get these wonderful, lovable animals with their soft fleece, and then you know, pretty soon I'll be turning, you know, making money hand over fist and the breeding. They breed like rabbits, so it's, it's a great deal. And they go and they show a bunch of people there saying, "Look, I didn't think I could do it either, but." I sent a thousand dollars, and now I'm a millionaire. And now I'm the alpaca bar, I'm the alpaca baron of you know, Dockyard County or wherever. Okay, so I've never actually fact-checked any of these shows. I don't have any proof that uh, these get rich quick schemes do not work. But instead, I just respond to them with a saying: "It seems too good to be true that it probably is. It just seems hard to believe it could be that easy. It seems hard to believe that it could be that easy." Okay, now if you go and start looking closely into the miracle aggregation, it does have a crucial assumption. And the assumption is that voter errors are random rather than systematic. So it assumes that when people don't know anything, they reach into their pocket and they flip a fair coin. Is that true? Is it really true that people who don't know what they're doing just flip a coin and do whatever the coin tells them to do? I don't know. Who knows? Right? Is that what uninformed people do? Okay, well, uh, so when I first started looking at this area, I said, well, what evidence is it that, the, this, that this assumption is true? So I said, look, you know, maybe it's wrong, but surely there has to be at least some semi-plausible body of evidence showing that voter errors are random. What I found is actually there wasn't really very much, even semi-plausible evidence. It was more like an assumption that sounded good to people and the math worked out, and it led to a conclusion that made people feel good. Right? So, of course, that doesn't mean it's wrong, but <laughs> it still should make you a little nervous. All right. So then I said, all right, well, you know, people are not really collecting much evidence on this. How about I go and do the work and see whether or not it works out? Okay, well, what I found is that when you look at public opinion data, there is actually strong evidence that systematic errors are the rule rather than the exception. People who don't know what they're doing don't flip coins. Instead, they generally start out thinking something that is plausible but wrong, and, they st and it's hard to change their minds about it. Okay, now there are several different methods that point to the same conclusion. If this were the one hour version of this talk, I would give you a few other methods. Uh, since I only have half an hour, I'm going to only tell you mine. Although, you know, just like Roger Marx, you know, if you, if these are my principles. If you, if you don't like them, I have others. Right, so this is my evidence. <laughs> this is my evidence. If you don't like my evidence, there's other evidence out there done by other people than me. But uh, if you want, if you want to be curious about it, you can read the book. Okay. So the main approach that I replied upon, write upon in my book, is what I call the method of comparison between layman and experts, or lay expert comparisons. The admittedly elitist assumption of this approach is that if people who study something for many years think something very different from people who have never studied the subject, the people who have studied it for years are probably right, and the people who have not studied it at all are probably wrong. Okay, note that I say probably. I don't claim this is some absolute truth. It, it, there are times when people study a subject and they're still wrong. It does happen. And so, all that I will say is that it is a presumption. It is a presumption. It's a starting point, one where I'm perfectly happy to entertain reasons why maybe the experts are wrong, or, of course, maybe the experts know what's going on, but they aren't telling the truth because it serves their interest to lie to you. Right? Another possibility. Okay. So what I wound up doing then is looking at data that compare the views of laymen and experts. And I was checking to see whether or not they systematically disagree. 
right? So whether there are patterns of disagreements, right? It'd be one thing if people hadn't studied a subject, sometimes thought that something was better than experts thought, sometimes thought it was worse. It would be another if, the, if people who had not studied a subject very reliably thought something was better than experts thought, or very reliably thought that it was worse, okay? And then, uh, you know, precisely because I realized that there are reasons, there are some cases where you might not want to trust experts, I, wanted, I added on what, what I call controls for kind of confounding factors. So in other words, I wanted to anticipate in advance complaints people would have about why experts couldn't be trusted and try to handle them before people could make the objection. Okay, so again, this doesn't mean someone can't think of another objection. And as you may have known from arguing with a five-year-old, someone can always just keep asking why indefinitely. But <laughs> still, if you answer the main objections that occur to people be beforehand, then I think it does switch the burden of, burden of proof back onto them. Okay. All right, now just, just to uh, you know, elaborate a little bit more, you know, so when would you not trust experts? All right, well, uh, suppose you go into a repair shop, as I recently did, and you hear, once again, you need a $2,000 repair. All right, and you tell the guy behind the desk, well, I don't really think I need that repair, I'm just gonna take my car, and he says, are you challenging an expert? Now, I have been working on cars for 20 years. What do you know about the inner workings of a transmission? Nothing, uh, but there is a reason to distrust you, which you, at least you might think to yourself, which is, you make more money if you tell me that I need an even expense repair, even if it's not true. Okay? So that would be a case where you might not want to rely upon an expert, even if you admit that he knows more than you do. All right, but you know, what if you're talking to a mechanic who knows that he's not gonna get your business? Then the expertise becomes much more reliable, and it starts to seem a little bit funny to say, what do you know? All right, and then finally, suppose the mechanic is your son. He says, Mom, your car will explode unless we take it right to the shop now. What do you know? Change your diapers. You didn't know anything then. Why, why, why should I think you know any more now? Okay, now that is a point where it starts to seem paranoid to say, I'm going to rely upon people who know nothing rather than people who've studied for years because what, is it, what do the experts know anyway? And again, you know, if, you're just willing, if you're willing to bite the bullet and say, even so, I don't trust those people, uh, then there's not much I can do. Okay, but if your complaint is a reasonable one, a reasonable argument why, why, why you might distrust experts, then I will try to handle that one. Okay, so the result that we see when you try to test for systematic disagreements between laymen and experts is that there are large disagreements between laymen and experts on important questions. All right, now, since I am an economist, I was naturally curious about uh, whether there would be systematically biased beliefs or systematic belief differences between experts and laymen on economics, but I know that not everyone finds economics as fascinating as I do. Uh, so I will give you two extra reasons why you should care about, uh, about lay expert disagreement in economics. Uh, so the first one is economics is highly relevant to a very wide range of modern policy debates. And so even when people are talking about whether to invade a country, people say, oh, well, we crunch the numbers, it's gonna cost a trillion dollars to do this. Uh, how many lives do we think that we could possibly prevent in terrorist attacks by launching this war? Uh, maybe we should just go and hire some more security guards. Maybe that would be a more cost-effective way of getting that security. Right? Or of course, when people are talking about health insurance, how much is it gonna cost? Right? How is this going to affect the incentives of people to get, the, to get their own health insurance? Right? So on. Right? So even in areas that people think of as not have it not being directly economic. Usually when you scratch the surface, there is a lot of economics to the arguments that we have these days. Okay, so that's one. Now, another reason, which uh, at least to me makes the story interesting, is that economists have been complaining about the public's views about their subject for several centuries. Okay, now you can say, well, not all experts complain about the public, not like we do, all right? So when physicists complain about the public, it's like the students aren't interested in physics, they think physics is boring, they don't try. When economists complain, it's, it's that on the first day of Econ 1, a student get, raised his hand and say, let me tell you, professor, you guys may think that free trade is a good idea, but my uncle lost his job, and, and, and let me tell you, that shows that this whole idea is stupid. And then you know, the economist may say, you know, I'm just trying to take a role here if you can get to your uncle later in the lecture. Right? There is a, a tendency that economists have noted for people who have never studied a subject to have strong opinions anyway, and to very loudly and, and vociferously share them with the whole world, right? which is not something you see in most subjects. Okay, so it's not just that economists are complaining that people are not interested in what we're doing, rather economists are complaining that our students think things that are wrong and we gotta fix them somehow, okay, if that's possible. Okay, all right, now if you're wondering, so what is economists' main complaint? I'll get to this in a little bit, but the overarching complaint is that the public underestimates the social benefits of the market mechanism. Right, so when non-economists look at the world, they see someone making money and they say, aha, someone agreed, someone's making money, bad. Right? Economists have almost exactly the opposite way of looking at things. They look at a problem, they see someone making money off it, and they say, well, that'll solve itself. 
But if you show them a problem where there's no way to make money off it, that's when economists get nervous. Right? So when you say that someone is making money selling Pokemon cards, economists say, all right, so then people make Pokemon cards, someone will come up with other, other products to compete, great. Right? What economists get worried is when you say, all right, global warming. Who's going to make money off of global warming? And then the economists, oh, let's see, um, I can't think of anything. All right, that is what economists worry. Okay, so this is a very stark difference between the way that economists look at the world versus not economists. Just you know, thinking, looking for you know, if, if, if there's a way to make money to solve a problem, economists tend to say things will work out. On the other hand, the economists start to worry when they can't figure out a way to make money off of something. Now, of course, I should mention that just the, the fact that an economist doesn't figure out a way to make money off of something doesn't show that no one can. So you know, I, I like to point out, you know, Maybe if we could figure out, if we were actually good at specific, figuring out specific ways to make money, we'd be doing something else. We'd be doing a different line of work. In any case. All right. So the, the fact that economics seems so important for modern policy debates and the fact that economists have been complaining for so long suggests that it would be interesting to, to, and, and valuable to test the public's economic beliefs for systematic error, to see whether there really is this tendency for economists and the public to agree on average, which is what the mirror of aggregation would have you believe, or if there's actually are clear patterns of disagreement. Okay. Now it turned out that I lucked out. Uh, there was a data set that some other people had constructed and they gave it to me for free. What a world. Okay. <laughs> yes, so this, uh, this was called the Survey of Americans and Economists on the Economy. There was one article based on it that was published and then that was all they did with it and then they let me have the data and then I published like six articles based on it. So I mean, I'm eternally grateful to them, but uh, so the, it was called the Survey of Americans and Economists on the Economy. The idea of the survey was to ask a wide range of questions about how the economy works to two, 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 two groups of people. One, a random sample of Americans, and two, PhD economists who specialize in domestic policy. Right? So people who actually would know something about the questions. Okay. Now, if the miracle aggregation were true, these two groups should have had the same average beliefs. Uh, did they? Uh, no. All right, so, yes, if you didn't know that, I was coming to that. So. <laughs> yes, that's where, that, 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 this, this is where I was leading the witness. Uh, no, there's actually large belief gaps between economists and non-economists, and the gaps are in the expected directions. They're in the same kind of directions that economists complaining and kvetching would have led you to believe. All right, so I will just give you the very quick version of the main clusters of differences that you see, again, because of time constraints. Uh, so the first one, as I mentioned, is what I call anti-market bias. It's a tendency to think that if people are making money off of something, then the social outcome is going to be bad. Right? And economists, like I said, have almost, the exa almost exactly the opposite view. Say, look, if we can figure out a way where someone can, can do well by doing good, when he can do good by doing well, then things will work out. I have many examples of this that I like. I'll just throw out one controversial one because it's fun. Uh, this is, you know, right now I look around the room and I see a whole bunch of perfectly good wasted human kidneys. Right? Because everybody's got two, you only need one. Uh, from, what I heard, from what I read about kidney disease, generally tax both kidneys, so you don't have an insurance kidney. It's not like you need a spare. Okay, and if you go down to a hospital, you know, what else is, what, what would be the closest hospital here? Georgetown Hospital? Is there, yeah, Georgetown, Georgetown Hospital. Uh, there's probably some people on dialysis, which uh, I've heard is absolutely horrifying. Right? So now that you know this, are you inclined to go and give, give someone in dialysis a free kidney? Because that's the only way that you can legally do it. Right? It is illegal to sell a kidney, it is legal to give it away for free. Uh, and so normal people think this, is, they think this is great. Economists, however, say, wouldn't it be a lot better if we gave some financial compensation to people in exchange for giving their kidney to a stranger? Right? And if, uh, they, if the non-economists then said, but then the poor would sell their kidneys. And then the economists would say, hmm, so then the sick will be well and the poor will have more money. And you're complaining about this, why exactly? Um, so that is the way economists think. I think it's a very reasonable way of thinking, and it, it is an extreme version of the way that economists think all the time. <laughs> all right, so that is one. And another main pattern you see in the data is what I call anti-foreign bias. It's one thing for a non-economist to admit that when one American buys something from another American, they're probably both better off, unless they have a kidney or something like that, which is crazy. Okay, but, uh, but when you start talking about someone from China selling something to someone from the U.S., that is when Americans and people around the world start to get very nervous. Look, you know, this, is, this person is from another country, and they're selling us something. Don't you see the problem? It seems like people, people on both sides are still better off. What difference does it make if they're from different countries? Would it make a difference if they were from different states? And of course, I've had this argument many times with my dad, uh, who has long believed you can solve all the world's problems, or no, all of America's problems, never mind the world, all America's problems with two simple changes in policy, uh, the first one is a naval blockade of Japan. 
<laughs> right? Or actually, in recent years, this has been modified to include all, to include China, right? Or all of Asia, really, because you never know what bad, horrible country could arise in Asia and, and to try, attempt to destroy us. And uh, the other one is a Berlin Wall at the Mexican border. Right? And if you could just do these two things, then everything would be fine. Okay, so this has been his view. Uh, this is a common attitude around the world. Uh, despite striking that when NAFTA was being debated, people in America said, you know, there's no way that we can withstand the low-wage competition of Mexicans. And what do people in Mexico say? There's no way we can withstand the high-tech competition of America. Right, so, uh, the, so you could say they can't both be right. That's true. Economists would also say they're both wrong. They're both wrong. All right, uh, another pattern you see in the data is what I call make-work bias. Uh, Non-economists tend to evaluate economic performance based upon employment. Economists tend to look at production. Right, which is you know, easy to see the appeal of looking at employment in, in the very short run, but if you step back and think, say, well, gee, what would have happened in the 19th century if we saved jobs, support, saved all the farmers' jobs? What would, what would be going on then? Well, we wouldn't be here, we'd be farming instead. Well, actually, probably most of us would not be here because uh, we, <laughs> if we, we would not have the modern technology to have even sustained the population that we have. Right? But you know, basically what, what, what happened in the 19th century as well as the 20th is that there were mass improvements in the productivity of, of, of our agricultural mm -hmm. workers. What this meant is that a small number of people could feed everyone. This caused unemployment. And what do those unemployment, well, unemployed workers do? Something else. What's the something else? Well, at the time, if you just said, hey, you'll go do something else, people would have been very upset with you. Uh, but you know, of course, if you, if you wouldn't have said, hey, they'll go and invent the internet, right? people wouldn't have any idea what you were talking about. Uh, very often, you need to first have people lose their jobs in order to, think, in order to get people thinking, well, what else do we do with these people? Right? And that is what we see. Uh, last pattern that we observe is something that I call pessimistic bias. Um, Non-economists tend to see the world in deep decline, bad now, and getting worse. Economists tend to have a more optimistic view of things. Even if you were to go and say, well, aren't the non-economists right this time, at least you know, this year? Uh, even there, I would say, well, let's see. I remember the 80s now, and compared to today, the 80s were terrible. Right? There were like three restaurants or three different kinds of food in my hometown, which is not a small town. And there were three channels on TV, or four if you held the antenna. <laughs> right? And, and you know, you know, so, according to me, especially hard on nerds, so I'll admit, uh, but you know, so the internet uh, has done more for us than other people, but still, there's all, you know, huge changes. You know, things that we take for granted now, where if we were suddenly stripped of them, we might say, wow, this is really bad. Uh, instead, we tend to dwell on the setbacks that we have rather than all the progress that we made. Okay. Now, the $100 question, uh, which is, you know, couldn't it be the experts who are biased? Maybe it's the economists who are wrong. Economists, they live in their ivory towers, they have their fat salaries, they have their nice lives, and then they come up with this whole story about why everything is great, and aren't they awful? Okay. <laughs> all right, well, uh, if, if all that you're willing to say is, look, the experts are biased and they won't say how, then it's very hard to show you wrong. But if you tell me a little bit more, if you say why you think the experts are biased, then it may be possible to check. Right? So it's the same thing where if, if uh, someone is testifying on the witness stand, and you say, I know, you're lying, Right? Uh, and this is, well, what specifically? I'm not saying. Just, they're just lying in general. I'm not going to give you any specifics. Well, in that case, it's pretty hard to show that the accusation of, uh, of, that you're telling lies is wrong. Right? But if you go and, and start giving some specifics, you start saying you're lying because you were here on the night of October 13th, then someone can say, well, all right, let's go get some evidence. Let's go talk to some witnesses. Let's see whether you really were there on October 13th. Okay? So as long as your accusation is vague, there's no way to disprove it, but there's also not much reason to take it seriously. When, you're at, when your accusation gets more specific, there is reason to take it seriously, although you also risk being shown to be wrong. Okay, so there are actually two very popular stories about why economists are evil and can't be trusted. Uh, the first one is what I call self-serving bias. It says, look, economists have high incomes, they've got tenure, so of course they don't think it's a big deal if people lose their jobs. Of course they think that international trade is wonderful. They're, per they're perfectly protected from all of this. Now, of course, they went and actually looked at the names in a typical academic department. They realized that we are not protected from international competition. In fact, professors are more subject to the horrors of international competition than any other occupation I know of. I know. Um, financially, I think it would be great, if, great for me if we would just boot out every foreign professor in the country. Of course, since half of them were my best friends, I'd be disappointed overall. But uh, in any case, uh, but, uh, this, this claim is that economists uh, have these distinctive views because they have high incomes and uh, high job security. Turns out that using the data set that I had, we can actually test this theory, right? Because if that is the reason, if high income and, job, and high job security is the reason why economists can't be trusted, then they should actually, an economist should agree with non-economists who have the same level of income and the same level of job security, right? So if the reason why economists can't be trusted is that they're rich and they can't lose their jobs, then anyone who's rich and can't lose his job should think the same way. 
right? So we can go and go to the data with this hypothesis, and what we can see is that this is just wrong. Non-economists who are rich and have a high level of job security basically think like normal human beings. Right? And on the other hand, economists with relatively low income and low job security, like an economist who knows that he lost tenure and can't get another job, still thinks like an economist. Okay, so that story doesn't work. Uh, the other main story that we hear is what we call ideological bias. This story says that economists are a bunch of right-wing conservatives. The only people who get a degree in economics are other people who feel comfortable with this horrible ideology. And therefore, it doesn't really prove anything because it's just a coven of back-slapping back guys who all think the same way. Okay, so that's another story that you, another story that you can tell. Uh, this one doesn't even pass the most basic test of, being, of, the, of, the, of the premise being true. It is true that economists have high income and high job security. It's not true that economists are conservative or right-wing. It's absolutely not true. If you go and take a look at the data, economists are more likely to be Democrats than the general public, and they're more liberal than the general public. Uh, you, so where does the, the stereotype come from? Well, it is true that economists are very right-wing for college professors, which means they're only a little, a little bit liberal by normal standards. Okay, but that's not the same thing as being conservative. Not at all. Okay. All right, so this is, this is my, my basic evidence. If you want the details, of course, read the book. Uh, now I come to the kind of question that occurs to economists, which say, look, all right, granted these systematic errors are true in practice, how are they possible in theory? Does theory allow these facts to be true? Right. Um, these seem like a funny question, and it is, it is kind of funny, but still, uh, there's, something, there's some wisdom in it. You know, if you saw a helium balloon, you wouldn't run up to a physicist and says, that fact disproves everything you say. Look, that thing is going up. The physicist might say, Theory is a little bit more sophisticated than what you may have heard. It does not claim that helium must sink. Okay. All right, so interesting. Okay. All right. Now, when I talk to other social scientists, usually they, they repeat a saying, which uh, is due to my uh, great kind of fake, my great retired uh, colleague Gordon Tulloch. They say, "Look, this is just rational ignorance. People don't bother learning about stuff that they doesn't really pay for them to learn." Okay. So that sounds good, but it's actually some big problems. Uh, first of all. Uh, the story that people just don't learn much about things with the, with the, that, where there's no financial payoff to the learning about them uh, doesn't explain why the other form of strong opinions rather than just being agnostic. Normally, when you've never read a book about a subject, you don't have strong opinions about it. You've never read a book about ancient Samaria. It would be unusual for you to run around talking, uh, going to a website saying, the ancient Samaria, Samarians were a matriarchy where they ruled by a god, ruled by a god queen who rotated her position every three years. Um, if you had never read anything about it, you probably wouldn't have a strong view about it. And if you met someone who had read even one book about it, you would say, oh, I never knew that. And if you, certainly if you met a professor of ancient Sumerian history, you wouldn't go and say, you're lying. <laughs> you're trying to deceive us in order to rob your, your, your own selfish ends. All right. So there's this puzzling lack of agnosticism, which, again, you may have noticed in political, political debates in general. How often is it that you want to bump into a person who just has no opinion at all about a controversial issue? It's pretty rare. Right? <laughs> All right. Uh, something else that rational ignorance doesn't really account for is why do people get so emotional about these issues? Right, so here is an experiment that my lawyer, also my wife, tells me not to tell you to try, but, but hypothetically you could try it. Uh, this is, why don't you just go to a political meeting of some group that you totally disagree with and in the nicest possible terms explain to them why they're wrong and see how many friends you make. All right. Uh, my prediction is that you could be the nicest person, but if you go to their meeting and start telling them that their views aren't actually incorrect, and they just probably like to know. Uh, not only you probably not make friends, you may have people screaming at you, you may be asked to never attend the meeting again, and you know, maybe something really bad will happen. Yes, I, I've had students who have gone to globalization rallies with, anti-globalization rallies, with counter-rally signs, and they actually have been told by guys, the scared guys in gas masks, you better get out of here, kid. Uh, you know, I'm a lot bigger than you, and I have a gas mask on, so <laughs> you don't want to mess with me. All right. Um, and, and again, here often I, I think about how my dad would react to something. So uh, in, in, in the mid-80s, you know, Clinton imposed the tariff on Mexican oranges. And I was thinking, well, according to rational ignorance, if I went and told, told my dad about this, he would say, oh, I hadn't heard about that. Or, you know, well, there's a tariff on Mexican oranges. Or he said, you know, or might, might have said, you know, what's a tariff? Or what's Mexico? Okay. <laughs> All right, so that's what rational ignorance would predict about my dad's reaction. But I know very well that's not how he would react. It's going to be something more like, it's about time we're finally getting tough with the Mexicans about those oranges. Those Mexican oranges have nearly destroyed our country. The only question is, you know, has this measure come in time, or is it already too late for America? <laughs> That's more of the kind of reaction I get from my dad. <laughs> okay. So it doesn't seem like rational ignorance actually describes the way that real people react you know, to, 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 to political issues in the face of knowing next to nothing about them. All right. So these problems inspire me to come up with an alternate story, which I call rational irrationality. 
rational rationality. And the intent of, the, of, of this uh, concept is to answer the question, look, why would people be rational at some, time, some of the time and irrational at others? Because you know, despite the fact that I make fun of my dad, he's a very smart guy, he's a PhD in electrical engineering, if I had to be stuck on one person that I personally know on a desert island, I'd probably choose him, because I think he could get me to the mainland alive. <laughs> Unlike all my other impractical friends who know who could give a lecture on free trade, but wouldn't be able to build a raft. Okay, so my dad's a very smart guy. Uh, so why is it that he's so rational on so many subjects, and yet on these other ones, what he says is, you know, again, it's not just that I disagree with it. I would fail my own father if he wrote this stuff on an economics exam. And it's just, it's not merely in, it's not merely that he's disagreeing with me. He doesn't understand the standard position enough to disagree with it. Okay. So what's the answer? Well, my basic answer is this: Look, irrationality is is a good like any other. You can use it to protect comforting beliefs from reality. And you, and so basically, here's the problem. As long as you're rational, you must always bet your beliefs every day. Some evidence could come along and make you change your mind. Well, what if you don't feel like changing your mind? Well, how about you just don't be rational? Right? When someone comes along with some counter evidence, and you know, I'm not listening, and I don't have to hear this, or you just say, you know, you're the son of the devil, only you know, this is, this is you know, I mean, I'd always heard that the devil would come in attractive guys, and it's you. <laughs> All right, something like that. Okay. So, uh, this, is my ba this, is, this is my basic story. Look, you know, if, as long as you're rational, you might have to change your mind. On the other hand, if you're irrational, you can continue believing whatever you like, whatever you want, for as long as you live. Like, pretty sweet deal. Okay, so far from being inconsistent with basic economics, economists should actually expect people to have crazy views about the issues where the cost of being wrong is zero. Right? And, you know, so, you know, and what, 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 how are they choosing that? Well, a lot of it is just about the emotional appeal. What, what feels good? What sounds good? Are budget deficits A caused by foreign aid? people we don't really like that much, or is it caused by all of the money that we pay to the elderly, people that we love and respect? Well, let's see, I don't want to blame anything on people I love and respect, therefore, it's foreigners who to blame. You know, never mind that the actual amount of money spent on foreign aid is almost nothing, and Social Security is the biggest program in the budget. So, if you go based upon what, what makes you feel better, one theory is more attractive than the other. Okay, so what I also say is, I'm not, I'm not merely claiming that people are irrational about politics. It's not just one ad hoc exception, Instead, it actually you know, has predictions about a lot of other areas where you might expect that people's views wouldn't make very much sense. You know, about you know, anything where you could be totally wrong and yet it wouldn't actually have much personal impact upon your life. Right? So it's not just politics, economics, religion, philosophy, a lot of science. You know, what does it hurt you to believe that the world is 6,000 years old? What happens to you? You wake up, you go through your day, it's fine. Unless you're a biologist, you know, then you may have some trouble getting a job. But as long as you steer clear of the life sciences, you can have any nonsensical view you want about the origin of the universe, and it's not really going to come and hurt you. Okay. Now, my last key question is, what's so bad about this? Or as economists would say, why is this inefficient? Well, uh, economists make, make a distinction between the private cost of an activity and the social cost. Right? So for example, the private cost of driving your car and polluting the air a little bit, to you, is almost nothing. Right? You go and you drive, you, you, if you drove your car yesterday, you wake up the following morning and say, the air is a little worse than it was yesterday because I drove. Uh, no. Unless your uh, parts per million detector is lost from your mind, uh, you know, your impact upon air pollution is so small that you don't notice any difference. So the private cost to you of driving your car around and putting out a little pollution is basically zero. However, this does not mean that it is okay for the world if everybody thinks this way. And of course, a lot most people do kind of think this way, right? Uh, this is a conversation. You know, look, the social cost is very different. The social cost you need to add up a small harm done to millions or billions of people. I mean, you multiply a small, barely perceptible harm by, say, seven billion times, like a little bit for every person on Earth, that can wind up being a lot. Okay? So economists are often concerned then about situations where every individual bears only a very small part of the cost of damage that they all collectively build up and do. Okay? So usually economists think about this in terms of something like physical pollution. What I want to say is when we think about irrationality as intellectual pollution. If one person goes and votes for idiotic policies, what happens to them? Nothing. The same thing would have happened to them otherwise, because you're just one person in a world of in a country with hundreds of millions of voters. Okay? However, what happens if hundreds of millions of people think something is ridiculous? Well, in that case, everybody's stuck with it. Okay? Now, just to anticipate uh, the the comments, the, the reply you're going to get, I should add. You know, so, is this advocating dictatorship? No. Is there anything nice about dictatorship? Uh, is this saying that democracy is the worst possible system? No. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I'm not saying that. Uh, rather, what I'm saying is that democracy could do better. A lot better, right? And the fact that you can go and point to other systems of government and say those are even worse, I just—I will admit that's true, but it doesn't really impress me. 
Right? Just in the same way, if you have a pro football team, let's see, actually I'm doing something here that I should never do, which is use a sports, a sports analogy, because I know nothing about sports, but I walk past your football field when I was before the talk, so it's not that, so. Any case, uh, but I'll stick with the sports analogy. So, uh, you know, someone is giving advice to a pro football team, it does not seem to me to be a very good reply to say, look, this team can beat any high school team. Or even to go and say, look, this team is average for pro teams. See, well, you're going to settle for being average? I thought we wanted to win. I thought we wanted to be good. So uh, while I'm perfectly willing to admit, and you know, very, very clearly do believe that, uh, that uh, dictatorship is much worse than democracy, uh, nevertheless, I don't think we should set the bar that low. Right? We, um, and especially now that democracy is so common. Right now is the time to start raising the bar and saying, well, now that we got this, can't we do a little better? So I'll leave it there. start off by saying that uh, much of the argument in the book is, is based on solid social scientific evidence. It is in fact hard to underestimate how little ordinary citizens know. This is true. It's pretty remarkable. But I'd like to put the irrational rationality test to you for a moment, if I can. And what you have in front of you are, what you have in front of you are a series of handouts. And Brian has anticipated some of what I want to say. But I'd like to take, take a little walk through uh, this. We'll call this the miracle of economic reform. It turns out, perhaps contrary to what we might expect, that if we were to look over a very, 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 very long period of time, and what I have in front of you in the very first slide, and I'll walk you through each of these slides, are data going over the course of decades. Over the course of decades, most democracies have engaged in what Brian in his book refers to as the Washington Consensus type policies, market conforming policies. If I look over the course between 1970 and 2007, the print's a little hard to, to read, democracies in particular have systematically liberalized international capital, international financial reforms, and perhaps more than any other, trade reforms. And there's a very powerful long-term year-by-year correlation between democratic processes and the emergence of liberal reforms. Perhaps dictatorships, you know, I don't mean to imply you, you defend dictatorships, clearly not. Brian has a, a very different agenda here. But it nonetheless is the case that there has been systematic, slow, but steady reform in the direction most economists would sort of like to see. Not happening fast, but it's happening pretty quickly. The next page, the third slide, uh, just a background. For the last couple of years, I've worked part-time at the International Monetary Fund in their research department. And one of the long-term projects the International Monetary Fund has had is a reform database. Uh, and some of the indicators that I created are part of this database, and some of them are not. Um, but the, the, the databases go across a whole range of different industries, agriculture, network, but which they mean infrastructure, internet sorts of things, trade reforms, banking sector reforms, securities markets, domestic financial markets, labor markets. Here too, what you find in the course of a democracy is systematic, slow, steady, market conforming reforms. Somebody's listening to you guys. It's happening somehow. There is this gradual emergence within competitive democratic markets for policies that would make an economist proud. Maybe not in the same degree you'd like to see them. The folks in the International Monetary Fund were um, very, in some sense, surprised to discover that there's this robust, strong association between democratic reforms, particularly in emerging markets, and subsequent adoption of market-conforming, economically liberal policies. Hmm. All right. Uh, the print came out too little, and I'm probably not going to make friends in the room by going through regression coefficients. But I'll, let me just, just say that in more careful systematic analysis, there's a very robust association between democratic processes, particularly the country becoming democratic, and its subsequent adoption of policies that would make Brian and company proud. In reform after reform, particularly in Eastern and Central Europe, you have enhanced trade reform, 
enhanced labor market reforms, enhanced uh, free mobility of individuals, greater political liberty, yes, but with greater political liberty has come greater economic liberty. Um, for all these biases, voters seem to be showing somehow, some, there's a miracle here of some sort. Maybe it's not the miracle of aggregation, but there is a miracle that's underway. It's not necessarily because people like economists better in all these other contexts either. I, I think you guys play about as well elsewhere as you do here. Uh, so there's a miracle. Um, let me develop the miracle even a little further. On the next page, we've graphed out, I've graphed out growth rates, and uh, I apologize for the small print. Uh, what we tried to do is look at a country's level of democracy in the late 1970s and look at its economic performance in the subsequent decades. The most democratic countries have a peculiar form of economic performance. That peculiar form of economic performance is extremely stable, steady, predictable growth, usually in the three, three, two and a half to three to four percent range with very, very low levels of economic volatility. Um, in the next graph, you'll see they also are associated with some very good social outcomes. Higher levels of life expectancy, higher levels of educational attainment. Uh, Danny Roderick, who makes a couple of cameo appearances in Brian's book, has also shown that they, on balance, pay higher wages, um, have higher social benefits. So another miracle is that there are some pretty good economic outcomes that are associated with democratic processes, and these processes seemingly are accumulating over time. Now, the miracle Brian wanted to talk about um, was the miracle of aggregation, but I want to talk about a different miracle. And this is the miracle of what we were talking about earlier on, the so-called low dimensionality of American politics. The work of a man named James Stimson at the University of North Carolina uh, has been pretty seminal. What Mr. Stimson has done is show that, yes, most people know very, very little. But what Mr. Stimson has done is, and, and for my students' room, there's going to be a quiz on this uh, on Tuesday, so I, take, I expect my students to be taking notes here on the, on the following pieces. I haven't gotten to this in class yet. What Mr. Stimson has done is take in lots of the survey data that Brian and others have, have worked with, and over the course of more than six decades, ask the question, if I take all these different surveys, is there something that unifies public opinion? Is there some sort of common underlying dimension? And the answer Stimson gives is actually yes. And in this, he draws on modern cueing theory, the, uh, the notion that what people do are look for relatively subtle cues. Mr. Stimson argues that the main way to think about American politics, and indeed politics in most countries, is along either one dimension or two dimensions. The main dimension, however, is a sense of economic liberalism uh, or they want people want the government to be, I'm sorry, backwards. I'm talking to an economist. Economic liberalism means something else. Liberalism in the Walter Mondale, um, Barack Obama, Bill Clinton sense of the word. We want government to be doing more of something or the reverse of liberalism in, in common parlance. We want the government to be doing less of something. And Mr. Stimson says that pretty much all of American politics can be summarized in that broad dimension and that it actually moves, it's not a stable dimension, it actually moves along the way of this little graph here, this little little cycle graph, not, not that well, the uh, title got chopped off, I'm sorry. What Mr. Stimson shows is that the movement of public opinion strongly influences government policies. There's a very, very high correlation. I don't know if this makes you feel better or worse, but it is the case that changes in public sentiment and public mood do seem to pretty strongly correlate to changes in public policy. Now, if in fact you have an irrational public, public that's irrationally irrational, the fact that politicians follow so closely public opinion could really actually lead us pretty far astray. And in, in your book, you do point out that, in fact, well, they do seem to follow. Uh, hence the sheep. Are they the sheep or the, who's the sheep? Fair question. Uh, I, I wasn't sure after I read the book whether it's the politicians who are the sheep or the voters who are the sheep or we're all sheep. 
Yes, my colleague pointed out the cover was unfair to sheep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I assume it's the politicians who are the sheep. Actually, it was, it was supposed to be the voters, but. All right, all right. Yes. But, but, but the, you, have, you have the politicians in your story following public opinion. Now, if in fact politicians are following voters, voters are irrationally rational, I'm sorry, rationally irrational, you'd expect some pretty crazy outcomes. But there's a miracle, what I just showed you guys, which is that over the course of time, there is a slow but steady and relentless liberalization of markets, a greater spread of economic liberty that's very closely connected to the spread of political liberty. Gee, how could this miracle happen? Well, just in the interest of, of uh, jumping ahead, it is simply that the main thing people tend to vote on, for better or for worse, is their sense of the economy. And I have a couple different things here. But in the interest of time, what I'd like to do is go to the little black, I'm sorry for this, should have numbered them, the, the one that says the economy, Obama, and the 2008 election. This is work drawn, done by uh, Professor Robert Erickson at my alma mater, Columbia, must be good. What Professor Erickson has done, along with many others, is show that most of us actually cue on the economy. And in particular, we cue on the economy in one of two ways. In those instances where the economy is going well, what we tend to cue on is wanting the government to do less of something. That is, when consumer sentiment is roaring, it's not now, by the way, uh, but when consumer sentiment is roaring, we expect less government involvement in the economy, lower taxes. When, as is the case, consumer sentiment is quite low, the uh, University of Michigan writers' numbers that were released about two weeks ago are pretty bad numbers. Thank thankfully, maybe they were coming out, but the consumer sentiment's still pretty low. People are still expecting higher levels of government involvement and more government reaction into the economy. Now, the argument I'm making here, very simply, is that when people vote their, their wallets and use that as their main cue, there's a dynamic that's actually a relatively virtuous dynamic for economists. This relatively virtuous dynamic is something like countercyclical economic policies. There are problems with that. But it also lays the foundation for slow and gradual market liberalization. That is, if voters want to be wealthier and they punish politicians if they aren't made wealthier, then some of the policies that you're describing actually end up showing in. One of the paradoxes of trade is, it is true, trade is not popular. However, it continues to happen worldwide. Trade liberalization has spread and expanded. And it's partly because when people show up, what Mr. Erickson and others have shown is they look at the economic performance of the last quarter and since trade really does, no, no doubt we agree on this, trade does lead to the wealth of nations, famous phrase. You, you originated that, didn't you? Trade does lead to the wealth of nations. There's a systematic, subtle bias, if you will, in the political elite to try to create the kinds of market-conforming policies that Brian would like to see. So the miracle of aggregation here may not hold. But there is a miracle, and the miracle is political reform is associated with economic reform through the mechanism of voters voting their pocketbooks. My question is um, about the subtitle of mm -hmm. your book, um, The Implication That Democracies Adopt Poor Economic Policies Due to the Systematically Misinformed <laughs> Assumptions of Voters. Um, but what about the literature that seems to indicate that um, states are actually autonomous, especially given um, what you were talking about with the paradox of states um, liberalizing their economies, despite the fact that these seem to be radically unpopular? Mm -hmm. um, could it, in fact, be that states are crafting public opinion and doing things that um, their voters are unable to interpret because of complex causal chains, because we can't actually um, understand the effects of certain economic policies until years after they're implemented? Uh, yeah, I think that's actually one, one important reason why policy is not actually worse. Right. So I mean, one, of the, one of the main things I talk about in the book is, look, before you study public opinion, you usually start wondering, how can the world be this bad? After you study public opinion, you say, wow, I'm amazed that we aren't living in the caves. Right. So I think you know, one, one, one mechanism that could explain why policy is worse is actually that voters will let politicians get away with implementing policies that are good, but they disagree with. 
right? So I think that's part of it. Although I would say that I'm actually I'm actually fairly convinced by this literature that he mentioned as well as others on how in democracy states don't really have that much autonomy. Politicians really need to try very hard to make the public happy. Of course, maybe the one makes the public happy is having a great smile and dressing well, and they don't care that much about your policies. But you know, usually, you know, you know, you know, when I go and just look at what politicians are saying during elections, it seems to me that they are trying very desperately hard to make people like them. And even once they have power, they're trying very hard to make people like them. So they want to say things that other people want to hear, and they want to do things that people like. However, they are sometimes able to get away with doing something a little bit different. Uh, one of the main things that I talk about in the book is the trade-off that politicians face between doing what people want and, and actually getting good results. Now, the fact that there's a trade-off doesn't mean that they will always ignore what the public wants and just deliver the things that give the best results, but it means that they will often try to say they're doing what the public wants and only do a little of that, and then do a lot more of what the public doesn't want and hope the public gives them credit for the results. So I think that's a lot of what's going on, but, but overall, I mean, in, uh, democracy, I think democracy works very well in the sense that politicians give the people what they want. I think they wind up, they wind up giving them something a bit better than they want, but it's pretty. But so, you know, if public opinion changes in the direction, politicians generally do change in that direction. I think that much is true. Like well, I said, it's you know, it's in some ways a reason for concern. The only thing I'd say is, particularly in the European Union, you do have gaps between responsiveness and what the bureaucrats in Europe do. I mean, I think the evidence is pretty strong that, that, that mm -hmm. there isn't that much autonomy. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the correspondence between public opinion and public policies, mm -hmm. it, well, I won't say public opinion, public mood mm -hmm. is pretty close. Right. And, and, and even there, I mean, in the case of the EU, you may say the public doesn't have much autonomy. They don't really get a chance to vote on the highest levels of the EU. But they could just always support whatever national politicians are, are, mo are, are most in favor of putting more limits on the EU, and that would be a, that would be a way of getting around it. It's just they don't care about it that much. They're not that you know. So so basically, you know, if people are willing to put up with something, then in a sense, politicians can get autonomy just from the fact that people are going to say whatever. Uh, you, you your one of your economic principles is that people will do what they get paid for. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that uh, there's money to be made in staking out an opinion that attracts attention and attracts some followers, regardless of whether it's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. You can make the money if your opinion is right. You can make mm -hmm. it if it's wrong, so long as it stands out mm -hmm. and attracts some followers. And that's an economic reason why some political, some opinion leaders are inclined to stake out opinions that are wrong because they get paid for doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's an important distinction to be made between politicians and intellectuals. An intellectual can make a great living having a view that's important to almost everyone. You just need to sell, you know, you know, to have some small market and you can do great. And you can actually get people to buy your books who hate your books or you listen to your show and you, and you get advertising revenue off of them. For a politician, it's generally much more important to have a view that is at least acceptable. I, you know, it's much harder, you know, so it's much harder for a politician to be truly hated by most people and still, still get elected. Again, you might have some regional base, but, but still, so, I mean, you know, politicians are much closer to the center of, of opinion than intellectuals who often really can do well by just making up some crazy thing and getting a lot of attention for it. To pick an example, uh, the, the picking up on the lady's uh, first question, uh, post-independence polling, uh, where uh, the government took dramatic in very painful steps uh, to liberalize their economy at tremendous social cost. Uh, would you comment on that versus how uh, your, your theory would apply? And over the long run it worked, mm -hmm. but for 10, 12 years, unemployment, selling factories, it was really hard. Uh, I guess what I would say about that is that uh, you would need to take a look at the average of all of the, uh, the post-communist economies. As it, you know, it, it is actually a rule that the economies that reform the most did the best soonest. Right? You, know, you can say they had high employment, but high compared to what? High compared to Belarus or high compared to Kazakhstan. So you can take a look at other, at other former communist countries that reformed less, reformed more slowly. Those countries did worse immediately and, are, and still are doing badly. So I mean, basically I'd say that they, just, that they had a very poor starting point where whatever they did, it was going to be bad. And then, uh, and, and then you know, what was called shock therapy got a lot of blame for things that would have happened no matter what policies were adopted, and it was actually the least bad approach to take. Uh, say, this, I'll say this view is not, it may, may, at least may not be a consensus view among economists, but it is my view. Well, I agree with it, but again, my point is that the politicians really did act in the short term, mm -hmm. contrary to what the public wanted. I mean, hmm. 
Mm. Yeah. I mean, part of In fact, the students in the room, we actually did the whole in shock therapy. Okay. Put a uh, case in the file. And actually, uh, the communists in the first free election won one out of 100 seats. Okay. So solidarity had overwhelmed the popularity. Right. They had a unified church behind them. So the, the public was very interested in, in sure. that, that particular set of policies. And it was crushing for Poland. Yeah. But we sort of forget that, um, that the uh, president of Poland at the time, a former um, shipyard worker who was famous right. once, uh, yeah. 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 won a Nobel Prize, I think, uh, actually. Mm -hmm. Right. A little later in his career, um, <laughs> almost won the re-election. It was a he, he yeah, lost sure. he lost in the, the second round, and uh, he w lost re-election to yes, the Reform Communist Party. The Reform Communist Party adopted his platform. Right. Right. They adopted his platform and told the voters that this was going to be. They both agreed on platforms, and so like the less I had, there's it's a complicated story, but <clears throat> the Polish people committed to reform, and they did not they didn't veer off. They stayed the course for 15 years. Yes. Actually, actually, now I am ready to give the comments that I was originally going to give. So I, I was confused by the fact that it was the first diagram. So uh, yes, yeah, so if you take a look at his first diagram, he's got things improving over the course of about uh, 40 years. Mm -hmm. All right, so I have no complaint about this, but the interpretation is the one that bothers me. So one thing you could say, look, if you can, if you can reform gradually for 40 years and still not be perfect, for you, you were either very bad to begin with or you reformed very slowly. Uh, again, you, that, you, that may seem like a negative attitude, but still, when, when someone has spent 40 years getting better and they're still not that good, say, so, you know, uh, that's, or I'll give you credit for having, for having improved, but, um, you know, I mean, this isn't kindergarten. We don't just give out stickers for most improved here. Uh, you know, we, you know, some, someone, should, you know, someone should actually have been doing, you know, things could have been better, and there's no real reason why they shouldn't be. It's worth, worth pointing out that, uh, when you take a look at where things were, especially on, you know, like, like um, you know, international freedom of trade in 1970, it's worth pointing out that, as far as I remember, it was, it was only around in, in the late 90s or, early, or around 2000 that we got back to the same level of world trade that we had before World War I. Right? So it took like 80 years to get back to where we were before. Right? Uh, it's really, really quite shocking to realize like, you know, they had actually managed to get things pretty good, and then it all crumbled on them. And then it took you know, 80 years for things to get back to where they were before. And again, you could say, well, democracy worked out in the end. Well, it worked out, or like in event, it was not the absolute maximum disaster that it could have been. <laughs> but still, is that, you know, I would think, think of that as this, this diagram dams with faint praise rather than being a great defense of democracy. Uh, can I, let me take, let me, I'm not going to let that, no, no. You're the moderator. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that, the graph, of course, of global averages. If I just had democracies, what you'd see is that most democracies now are completely open to international financial flows. They're mostly open to international trade flows. They're almost all inter open to international financial current flows. So yes, it took a long time. But on balance, most advanced industrial democracies are there. Eh, I don't think so. But I, you depend, again, depend, we have a question about It depends that. upon how low you set your maximum measure. OK. So well, if you say the US has free trade, then maybe. Uh, Herbert Gestalter, neither of you addressed the tremendous amount of money that is now being spent on election, election campaigns, especially in the United States, and whether that amount of money is interfering, to whether that amount of money which is now being spent on campaigns in the United States is interfering with the processes that you both described. And I'd, I'd like to hear you comment on that. I mean, in a sense, I would, I, when I hear that something might interfere with the process, I get optimistic. <laughs> uh, you know, I would, you know, a couple of facts. First of all, while people may people may say there's a lot of money in politics, when you divide it by GDP, it's almost nothing. Like so, uh, you know, there, there, it depends upon exactly what you count as money that is try, that is trying to influence politics, but usually it comes out to be you know, like well under one percent of GDP. So it's you know, kind of, you know something from com comparable what people are spending on beer or something like that. So it's actually not that much, which suggests that uh, people who are donating, who are, people who are buying politicians aren't getting very much for their money. <laughs> so I think that's what I actually meant is the amount of money that is spent getting a message out during an election campaign. But that's even less. That's even less. So I understand yeah, it, it's the effect that that mm -hmm. may have mm -hmm. on the, the, items that you, the, the, the points that you've been discussing mm -hmm. of 
the uninformed voter, is the uninformed voter even more uninformed because now he's being misinformed or just being uh, so getting so focused on, on voting on an image that hasn't been created by money in a, in a campaign? I think actually somewhat to the surprise of this is that where maybe the views of political scientists vary from the general public. Talk about ways of being. Most political scientists have actually come to the view that lots of money in politics enhances the contestability of markets and that the ability of the major political parties to raise money um, provides greater opportunity for voters to assess their competing claims. And so the, the flush of money, um, there's actually a very nice paper by one of my colleagues, Michael Bailey, in the government department, making an argument that actually, in some ways, there's not enough money in politics. If there's more money, then there'd be third parties and other views that were out there. And a number of people have been arguing that um, you'll have a greater citizen knowledge with greater political advertising. So there's, a, there's another academic view that actually suggests there's too little money. I don't know about your view. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have uh, as optimistic a view of, uh, of money in politics. So I, mean, I do, you know, to, to some extent, I think the politicians are basically being bribed to favor you know, policies that are even worse than what the public would want. Although it, it is worth pointing out that there are some very simple strategies whereby the public could counteract this whole problem. Like one thing is you see that, that a candidate has a whole lot of commercials and therefore has a lot of money, don't vote for him. Right? So this seems counterintuitive, but it's, it's actually a much harder argument to answer than it seems. And look, if it, if it, once you realize that a candidate has a lot of money, you should assume that he has prostituted himself and therefore oppose him. Right? And this would, this would be a very simple way for voters to get around this problem if they were so inclined. Of course, the problem is that voters aren't rational enough to do that, so they're more likely to say, oh, what a wonderful commercial, and he's there with his white and kids, flags waving. I've been told two questions, so one Well, uh, I don't know if I agree with either of those statements. I'm a professor at Georgetown in the Communication, Culture, and Technology program. Um, on one hand, you have the issue of voter fatigue if it's a longer cycle and there's even more money put into it, but that's not my question. My question is, um, what would you propose or suggest as a better system than a representative democracy then? And uh, what would you suggest for making uh, making voters make more rational decisions? Uh, very good question. So um, I'll have to make some assumptions about what you're allowing me to change, but uh, but here go <laughs> here goes. So uh, you know, like, like the most basic and most doable things. I've told economists we've got to improve economic education because we're so boring that we just put people to sleep. We've got we have to make we have to quit saying on the one hand on the other hand on issues where we've got a clear consensus because people then wind up taking away no message at all. Uh, so you know other 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 areas where you can think about so let's see so we can just just sort of moving from the most realistic thing which is just improving economic education to the least realistic things. Uh, in, in my book, I got a lot of flack for saying maybe we should give the Council of Economic Advisors veto over economic policy. You know, as the Supreme Court can rule things unconstitutional, let economists rule things uneconomical. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, unrealistic, but I think that would be, I think that could be, you know, is likely to be an improvement over what we have. Uh, some other things that I suggested, uh, you know, giving two votes to college graduates. Um, yes, yes, again, people get horrified and angry. And partly I say these things just to point out, look at how horrified and angry you get about this without considering whether or not it would be a good idea. <laughs> like you're so religious about this that you can't even entertain a notion that is heretical to you. Uh, but again, I, I think you know, ultimately you know, like, you know, there's a lot of value in just making very clearly a point, um, just because most people think something doesn't make it true, does not make it true. The American people may think something, but the American people could be totally wrong. And just to, to get that point across, I think it's a lot of value. It's a lot of what I think. The system that we have in representative democracy, the system that we need to advocate for, or would you propose a different one? Um, <coughs> see, again, again you know, compared to what? I mean, one of the main things I think would be better is just for, for government to be involved in less, like to vote about fewer things. Right? So, right now, we have whole areas like freedom of speech, religion that we just don't vote about. I think it'd be a good idea to think about having a lot more areas like that. Again, you know, you know, what do you call representative democracy, right? Does the fact that we, that we can't pass a law saying that no one is allowed to be a Catholic make us less of a democracy? In some sense, yes, and in another sense, no. Right? So uh, the, the way that a friend of mine told me that I should market it is, look, we need to have better democracy. And better democracy may involve much less safe for the public. Last an observation to it and a question. Actually, I met Mike Willems once, and he, his personality may explain why he was able to convince, I mean, you convince people to vote against what you may have thought their self-interest was. You, when you meet him, it's just, it's phenomenal. 
But why irrational, why rational irrationality? It, and it sort of goes back to the question about the cover of the book. Who are the sheep? Mm -hmm. Is it opinion leaders or politicians defined broadly, not just office holders, but union presidents and talk show hosts? Who are misleading or misinforming? Or do common people not have common sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's mostly the latter. Right? <laughs> <laughs> if, if the common people have common sense, then in order to go and make money by being, by being a talk show host or a politician, you need to tell them things that, they, that, that made sense to them. Right? So when do, you, when do you not talk sense? When your audience will pay you for will pay you not talk sense. Right? Now, now again, this doesn't deny that, that, uh, that, that at the fringes there may be some additional ways in which politicians or talk show hosts can make things worse. But I mean, you really, really you know, the striking thing to me is how you know, the general public believes many things that almost no actor, that almost no expert believes. Right? It's not just that they listen to bad experts; they believe things that it would be very hard to find anyone who's studying the subject things, and yet they believe it. And it's very hard to talk them out of it. So, so you know, in the end, it is more of a lack of common sense and, uh, and believing things that make you feel good, rather than uh, you know, that being the fault of opinion mowers who basically are serving a market. And if the market wants to hear something that's nonsensical, they'll tell them that. Thank you very much.